things. <laughs> it's like the biggest understatement of Aaron's job ever. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. It's one of those things that you just, uh, you know, she's she's driving the ship, but, <laughs> you know, there, there's all their features. Totally. Just so everyone knows, these cruises are really expensive. So, like, these samples, when we get them, they're, like, worth, like, it's, like, millions of dollars have gone into collecting them. Like, there's, like, research budgets that are, you know you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that go into this treasure chest, you know. What yeah. if there's just a shoe in there? <laughs> <laughs> what if? I mean, we are bringing up a treasure chest every time. Hercules brings us back all sorts of wonderful rock samples and water samples, biological yeah. samples. Those are treasures. That's and really the true treasure here. Yeah. And the ferromanganese crust do have a high concentration of metals. If we were collecting C4 massive sulfides, they have a higher concentration of gold. Um, so yeah. And you do get to open it up, right? When do you get to use that rock saw? Well, after I do my top scrapes. Oh my goodness. Huh. I think this is an anemone that is living in the sediment. Oh, that's very cool. Hello, football. It looks great. That was a very beautiful one. Oh, fine. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm curious if it would pull back down into the sediment if it was disturbed or it would just like close up. But we're not going to disturb it. You can probably camera rack out too. I just rack in for the sample. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, football, go away. <laughs> I've had enough of your shenanigans. A shrimp. Another one of those red shrimps. There are lots of different kinds of red shrimp in the deep sea. So many. So many red shrimp. As my grandma calls them, scrimp. Scrimps? She's from Texas. <laughs> scrimps. I love their little legs. So this one could be an Aristius. It's a red shrimp in the family Aristeidae. You can see its long swimming legs. Another one of those Brasingid sea stars. We've seen quite a few of those today. On the one boulder. Well, I guess some of those others could be considered boulders.
Oh, here's another one of those uh, Peskills. Show us your home, Cuskiel. <laughs> Give us a grand tour. Yeah, this might be Diplocanthopoma. I think I saw the lateral line kind of make a zigzag, starting up high on the head and then going down the midline of the body. Where do they typically make their homes? Or do they just free swim like vagabonds? Uh, they like to hang out near rocks, usually. They really like being in crevices or next to a rock. It's probably why that one was like, ooh, let's get out of here. Here's another Semperella, glass sponge in the family Pheronomatidae. It likes to root into sediment. So it sends long spicules down into the sediment. So if we were to pull the sponge up, it would just have very long spicules at the bottom. A lot of rocks, a lot of sediment. That's our Caliphacus glass sponge. That's our rosellid glass sponge. See another one of those C pens with a opioid associate. Zoom in, please, Aaron. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. Oh, and there's uh, that same tubular hydrozoan on it. Oops. Thank you. On the subject of sponges, we have a question. Do sponges have any sort of internal structure beyond that uh, outside we see? Um, so the sponge's structure is made up of spicules. Those are those glass uh, pieces that make up the skeleton. And so all of those glass pieces are individual pieces that sort of link together to create a framework. We call it the dictyonal framework. And that's what makes up the, the glass sponge skeleton. And so every sponge is going to have a different set of spicules that are making up its skeleton. Some of these spicules are long and super thin. Um, others are uh, have are called hexasters, which are have six um, sort of spines uh, sticking out. Uh, they all look 
very different and every every sponge species has its own unique array. Yep. So you can actually identify species based on the spicules that it has. But that's what the structure is made up of. And those spicules are actually real glass. Yikes. Wouldn't want to get caught in there. <laughs> this is kind of weird. Oh. It might yeah. be another Semperilla, but it looks really skinny. A skinny Semperilla? Maybe a Skimperilla? A Skimperilla? What's the thing up in the left corner? Is that oh, a Oh, that, that might a be a, yeah, that's a fish. That might be a Halosaur. Yeah, that's another Semperilla. Let's look at the fish. Okay. Yes, please. <laughs> Fish is top left. It's our fish. We don't have to describe things. We've got a telestrator. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like this might be our first halosaur. Looks like it could be Aldrovandia. So the way to tell that it's a halosaur in this genus is that um, Aldrovandia does not have any scales on the top of its nose. So if we have the opportunity to zoom in to the head of this fish, we can see it doesn't have any scales. Oops. Another way to identify this fish from afar is the way that it swims. They usually have their head down uh, and their tails yeah. up. Are they looking for something? Oh, oh, there he goes. Maybe I'll try to... Never mind. Maybe Sorry. the next time we can uh, zoom in on the head. But I'm pretty sure that was Aldrovandia, just because of um, the way the nose looked a little translucent. If it had scales there, um, it, would, it wouldn't look as translucent. Okay. But we might get another chance. Go ahead yeah. and... Oh, come on. No, oh. no. The fish is a little freaked out. <laughs> Sorry, fish. Come back. Okay. Where am I going? Other way. Those are another one of my favorite fish in the deep sea. They're just, they're kind of cute, like little, little dragons. I take bubble a sec. Yep. Their pectoral fins kind of come up and back like little wings <laughs> on the sides of their body. Do you have any theories on why the uh, nodules, well, they're not always evenly spaced, but um, in the case where they're very evenly spaced, do you have any theories as to why that happens? Well, my assumption would be that there's ferromanganese crust on all of, on, you know, most of the seamount and places where it looks like there's not that much nodule is, you know, has to do with the sedimentation, but, um, if there's a lot of sedimentation, it's really hard for the ferromanganese crust to continue growing. So if you have a lot of detritus material on top, it's going to make it more difficult. So that's why you'll see more clusters of ferromanganese crust, whereas like here, it's really silty, so it's sandy. So it's going to be hard for them to grow. Is that a shrimp? And there's shrimp, another Semperella.
C pen with associates. Yeah. Oops. Bonk. Oh. Looks like there's another scalpelid uh, barnacle on that rock. You zoom in, Aaron. Sorry, I've created a cloud of dust for you. Cool. Hmm. That's another one of those gooseneck barnacles. And that one could possibly be uh, Alcocianum. And then it looks like there might be an Anthemastis on that boulder. That's a mushroom coral. Zoom in, please. Along with a crinoid. When it has a baby. Oh. It's all right. So there are two possible genera for these uh, mushroom corals, Anthemastis and Pseudoanthemastis. But it can be difficult to see the characters that we need to tell them apart. But this one looks uh, like yes. it had started budding um, and producing some uh, little little baby mushroom corals. Mm -hmm. Saw those mm -hmm. singular polyps to either side of the bigger one. Sorry. Yeah. Let's go in again for a really quick zoom, Erin. Very cool. Okay, come wide, please. And there's a small, tiny anemone on that rock as well. More of those Romilogorgia militaris, the Chrysogorgia corals, and
chugging along through the valley. Yep. Slowly but surely, we are making our way up this seamount. We are currently at a depth of 2,696 meters. We Will are... we get to the rock on this watch? The rock? <laughs> the oh. rock sample. Here's hoping. Uh, well, we might. Go Our ahead. rock sample should be at 2,570 meters. Exactly. I've got it pegged. <laughs> you marked it already? Well, I think so, but I had to count contours, and I'm really bad at that. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, if we keep chugging along, we can get there, do some rock sampling. Yes, please. It's our mission. <laughs> Here's another unbranched bamboo coral. Now sometimes these really long whip corals uh, will have a branch right at the end. Trick us into thinking they're unbranched, but then they are. And one of Scott Francis' students is actually studying um, the sparse branchers. This one is a regular unbranched. So there are some theories as to how we might get sparse branchers. There might be a damage to an area and then a branch forms there or they just normally sparsely branch. We, we don't really know. It's a really interesting question. Another interesting part of this coral colony would be the base. Now, some of the these unbranched bamboo corals um, have a node right away at the bottom, and some have a long um, first segment between nodes. And that can help ID it to clade. Yeah, but that one looks like it might have had some damage up near the top that healed over, but it didn't cause a new branch. Interesting. Bonk. And look, uh, the uh, tissue has receded a little bit, and you can totally see those nodes, those black bands, and the internodes. So this one has that long bone um, in between the first two nodes. It's good to note. Bonk. Question in the chat, how far apart are the two lasers from each other? Ten centimeters. Ten centimeters. Yes. And they seem to come together, but they do not. They are perfectly parallel. That is just the magic of first point perspective. Just like railroad tracks in the distance.
I said, did you say something? Oh. All right, we have a, looks like a bolasoma sponge, possibly, um, and a bamboo coral that we're passing by. And there's a calatheca sponge. So this is a good example of how the bolasoma and the calatheca, which are both stock sponges, are different. And you can see they're different because of where the stock comes into the base of the sponge. So for the bolosoma, the stock's coming on the bottom and the colophagus, it's coming into the top of that head. It's not exactly easy to draw that, but bolosoma looks like that. Calophagus looks like that. <laughs> Yay, sponge sketches. It just disappears so quickly, you gotta draw fast. Glad you explained that because, you know, from a non uh, marine biologist point of view, it's have you seen the Devil Wears Prada where she's like, these two belts look exactly the same because she has like no fashion sense whatsoever. Like, wow, those look exactly the same, but they don't. Now that you've explained it, I do see the difference. Yeah, it's where the stock uh, goes into the head of the sponge, uh, and sponge taxonomists have different names for that surface. Uh, they call it the atrial surface, and uh, they've got lots of names for lots of things. If you you want to feel really confused, try reading a uh, description of a sponge paper. It definitely throw new words at you left and right. Um, they have special words for every type of spicule and the surfaces of the sponge. And that could probably be said about most uh, taxonomy papers if you're not familiar with that animal. So uh, scientists have come up with words in order to describe specific things on animals that don't have, you know, exact names or common names. So you have to learn basically a whole new language in order to speak about something. And that's why if you uh, hear myself or other speakers um, on the chat and uh, online, uh, saying all different words that you don't understand, it's probably because, you know, there, these are specific terms that uh, scientists have agreed upon to talk about these animals. And as you listen more, uh, the more you'll learn about what the words are and what they mean. So uh, especially like, say for these uh, Romilogorgia corals, I'll often say corals like that are lyrate, uh, meaning that the branches arise in sort of a regular pattern that are evenly spaced apart, sort of like a, on a lyre, which is a musical instrument.
I think earlier I was talking about a norella that looked like it had dichotomous branching, meaning that you know, the branches occur uh, in pairs. I know geologists have all sorts of fun terms too, uh, ways to describe rocks. So in the lab yesterday when we were describing our rock samples, we, I was learning about uh, the difference between sub-rounded and, and rounded, angular and sub-angular. Yeah, and then you can sort things. Hold up, hold, 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 hold. How do, how do you get sub-rounded? So <laughs> it's... um. It's very, uh, what's the term? What's the word? Like, it's very not... You're going to have to give me some more to go on there. Yeah, so... Like it's, a... not like, it's not like a precise, like, thing. It's... What do you call, like, art? Like, you can't... Like, when you're in an art school, like, the way you grade, it's subjective. Uh, so it's like... No, the no, word. there's <laughs> rules. It's not all subjective in art school. But I do understand. So like it's it's like more subjective. So you kind of have to make a call and like just based on you know what you've seen before. But they have like pictures that show so like angular is like really hard edges, like triangular like geometric kind of shapes, and then rounded would be um, a circle. And then yeah. you kind of go in a line from there. But so then you have like a middle, which would be like in between. How do you get sub less circular than circular? Or do you mean it just more <laughs> angular? Is that what? It's more angular okay. than round. Yeah. yeah. So, so like it, it's mostly circular, but then there's like sort of a one angle to be like sub-rounded. Uh, here we're looking at an anemone. Uh, this is an anemone back. in the family Actinostolidae. And yeah. I call this one actinostolidae bulb because it has these sort of round little bulbs at the ends of its tentacles. And that's how I differentiate that one from ones that don't have bulbs on the ends. We're not sure if that is a real character uh, for telling the difference between um, species uh, or genera yeah. inside this family. Just but settle down here. it is an interesting character. So I do make a note of it by, by calling it bulb. Oops. It's a thing that now. Way, You've yeah. made it a thing. It's it's a thing. Okay, like, I don't know if in. it's a real thing, a real taxonomic thing, but it does put this one um, apart from the other ones that don't have that feature. And I think it's really cute. It? Sorry, Aaron. And these anemones can actually is. get really large, which is impressive. Looks like Herc's coming in for a close-off with Argus. I hope not. <laughs> oh, gee. Swim away, swim away. Yeah. And that was the magic of a zoom. 
I'm back on full wide. All right, we're getting into some more rocks and some more Ramelagorgia. Definitely, definitely a dominant species so far. Keep seeing these all over the place. We saw some yesterday too on Seamount C, and this is currently Seamount G, but not nearly as many as we're seeing today, that's for sure. Been seeing quite a few unbranched bamboo corals as well along our way. Got another 100 meters to go vertically up this mountain until we can take our next geological sample. That's super close. We're going to make it. We've got half an hour. I don't know if we'll make it. For our watch. I believe in Team Blue Water. <laughs> I mean, it's doable. But we'd have to move pretty quick. Yeah, we'd kind of have to buggy. Buggy, buggy, buggy. Yeah, if we were moving across the abyssal plane, I think it, it could get there right by the end of our ship. But I don't think we're going to get there. Oh, negativity. Get out of here. <laughs> We're making the push, folks. All right. We're running for it. Who needs Argus? We don't need <laughs> Argus. Just leave Argus behind. Yeah. There's our little stars again. Yep, here's another Brasingid sea star. Another one of our consistent members of this uh, deep sea community that we've been surveying. Seeing quite a few of those along with these Rimilogorgia uh, corals, bamboo corals. I haven't seen a sea cucumber in a while. But earlier in the dive, we saw quite a few sea cucumbers. On the rocks, I've spotted quite a few little Brittle stars, occasionally some crinoids. Those are also known as feather stars. But this is a relatively sparse community so far. I'm hoping as we get shallower, things will get a little more interesting. Not that it's not interesting, just, uh, you know.
More variety, perhaps. Yeah, more, more variety. See something new. Perhaps brand new. Oh. Purple dude. Yep, purple sea cucumber. See, I said, I said I hadn't seen one in a while, and there, there is. Yeah, we've seen that sea cucumber before today. So even though we're not seeing a lot of new things, we are seeing, you know, quite a bit of things. Yeah, as opposed to uh, most of Seamount C, which was pretty sparse. Yeah, see, like every so often we see the you know, same sort of stuff. This might be another Hymenaster right there. And then I'm in quite a few of those Romilla Gorgias. No, e almost evenly spaced, I'd say, throughout this dive. You might get small patches of them and then move on and see another small patch. Yeah, so that looks like a Hymenaster sea star. As those are known as slime stars for reasons that I'm no longer allowed to talk about. Thank you. What? <laughs> okay, I've got the facts copy pasted. <laughs> this one's really cool. Uh, it's very translucent, so you can like see the internal structure of that hymenaster. So it has this sort of um, top layer, uh, and there's like a little opening at the top that'll open and close. Um, I believe they call that the osculum, just like as it is in a sponge. You know, that shape reminds me very much of a sand dollar. Exactly. Uh, sand dollars are econoderms, and so they're in the same group as the sea stars, and they have that pentaradial symmetry as well. I always like collecting sand dollars at the beach, but sometimes they turn your hands yellow. You ever get that? I haven't had that happen. I did break one though, and it was very sad. That is sad. Why did they turn your hands yellow? They like, uh, when they're stressed, they give off a chemical that's supposed to deter predators and uh, turns your skin yellow. Mm, That's not all up, of them, but th those are the ones that I was picking up in Florida. I don't pick up living ones. Oh, yeah, no, I was like picking up living ones. I, I put them back, but I like pick them up to look at them. See a marine biologist doing that? Yeah. You I know. just assume <laughs> that every living thing I pick up on the beach is probably going to try to take me out in some way or another, stinging or, you know. Yeah, like well, that's it's safe to uh, not touch things if you don't know what they are. Um, definitely a good practice. I have a lot of, believe it or not, a lot of jellyfish on the Washington coast. So <laughs> I've grown up knowing just don't don't touch stuff. Yeah. Or touch it and see what happens. You uh, can you can smack the top of a jellyfish. And some of my friends like to do that. <laughs> the ones that have washed up on the beach. You can hear them snapping when you're scuba diving around there too. The jellyfish? That's what I, I, that's what I was told. I've never independently verified that, and now I'm presenting it as fact. But <laughs> that's what I was told is that you hear the like the sizzling sound. Huh. Interesting. There's another one. I of don't know if I've ever heard that sound. There's there's a sea cucumber you wanted. Oh yeah, that's a Oneirophanta sea cucumber. Oh yeah. Are we shallow enough for it? Yet? Um no, I want to wait until we get to the top. It's waving hello, hello. Okay. <laughs>
How do you know if a sand dollar is, is alive or not? Um, they get, when they're properly dried out, they're very uh, hard and white, like a bleached white color. You can kind of like tap on them and they make like a, a hollow dry sound. Yeah, when they're alive, they're they're going to have a little bit of color to them and they'll have all their uh, tube feet. So um, they'll actually, if you put them in your hand, um, start to walk on your hand and sort of suction themselves to your hand. If you were watching earlier when we were collecting that sea star, it was sticking to the manipulator and uh, we were having some trouble getting it to let go to be put into the bio box. The same thing will happen with a sand dollar um, when you put it on your hand, it'll just sort of use its little tube feet, and uh, that's how it moves around. It also has its spines, and it'll move those too, so you can actually feel them moving uh, while you're holding them. They look like they wouldn't move very fast, but some sea urchins uh, can actually move quite fast. So sand dollars um, are related to sea urchins. They're just sort of compressed. And cake urchins. What always surprises me is uh, how fast clams can burrow into the sand. Oh, yeah. And they're trying to go clamming and they just kind of shoop. Oh, I like to do that um, when you find the, those little, um, little bivalves on the beach. Mm -hmm. And you just like pick up a scoop of sand and you just put them on top of the scoop and see how much, uh, how fast they burrow, and they'll try to burrow down into your hand. Oh, I've it's never really tried cute. that. Or you have races to see see which one burrows the fastest. Wow, you are a marine biologist. Right <laughs> no, I would totally do that. Yeah, finding little invertebrates on the beach is a, a pastime of mine. I, I very much enjoy seeing them. It makes me happy. I collect shells, like spirally shells. Mm -hmm. I try not to bring too much stuff home just because I don't need any more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't pass up a really good shell. I mean, you really cannot. Like, what if you get like a complete spiral, like top to bottom? Oh yeah. Well then, you know, you find something like that. That's, that's like a treasure. Oh, oh, a PSA for all of you watching. Uh, if you do pick up a shell, A, you know, make sure the beach allows it, allows you to take it home. But B, also watch for any organisms that might be living in it. They might surprise you like a little octopus. Yep, uh, a lot of those snails can actually um, pull their bodies really far up to the shelf, so you might not actually be able to see that the animal is in there just by looking. Um, so it's best to uh, leave that animal alone, uh, let it settle, and uh, it'll move on in its day. The last thing you want to do is take home a live animal and have it start rotting in your car. Oh, uh, no. that, that's, it's one very sad for everyone and smelly um, and that animal uh, would like to stay in its home so please don't take home live animals and there are some uh, spirally shells you definitely don't want to oh, take home ah, yes. just in case uh, those are the cone snails um, they have Spears and they, they hunt by basically spear fishing. Um, and the ones that do hunt for fish uh, are potentially very deadly to humans. Mm -hmm. So um, try not to pick up or handle cone snails. Uh, you'll know which ones they are because they are pretty much your the one that everybody wants because yep. they're gorgeous, gorgeous shells uh, and they're very dangerous. I lifted up a rock once and there's this bright, bright orange.
like, oh my gosh, are you alive? And I, like, I, you know, tried to get as close to it as possible. And then I saw it was indeed stuck to the rock. Ah, darn. I'm not going to get anywhere near you then. Yep. Any octopus? I don't believe we've seen any octopus. No, no octopus yet. You know, I think, I think they hide from me. You they know how much I love them. Uh, they hide. So we do. We meters. could potentially see an octopus here. We'd likely see uh, Grimpatuthis. Uh, that's those the Dumbo octopus. They have those little flappy, flappy ear flaps that are just super cute. Grumpatuthis. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh. You'd think that they would be very grumpy then, right? Huh. They could be grumpy or really happy. They're kind of kind of wrinkly looking sometimes if you get a nice up close view of them. They got really cute eyes. I don't know. I think they're pretty adorable. Yeah. Got a shout out for a marine biologist keeping everybody safe and all, and safe on land and safe in the sea. Life saving tips for beach going. Yeah, I, I've noticed that a lot of people don't know about some of the potentially dangerous animals that you might find on the beach, um, and you can, just can't make the assumption that it's safe. I've always, uh, well, in my recollection anyway, I, I've always lived on the coast, so I forget that not everybody lives on the coast, right? So there are tons and tons of people who would never even know that uh, such dangers were, were an issue. Mm -hmm. And every time you go to a new place on the coast, there's a whole new set of animals that you might not have ever seen before. So. It's best to ask someone local uh, who knows the local wildlife if you have any questions. All right, we've got 50 more meters to go. Well, 30 more meters to go. 30 more meters. Yeah, we have Will we make minutes? it? Absolutely. Who knows? 30 yeah. meters pushing 30. into the currents and the wind. Get that get that last rock sample for turnover. Yeah. Here's hoping. And water sample. Yep. I got to get that manipulation time in. So this is a sea lily, the type of crinoid that lives on a stalk. And this is a hyocrinidae. And I know this because it has you know, these, it's bright yellow and has five arms. So hyocrinidae, a sea lily, or a stalked crinoid. Sometimes we see gastropods on these sea lilies, um, but there's none on this one. But if we did see that, that'd be a really interesting association to note. Oh, and we have a fish visiting us. What? Maybe 20 more meters in, and that would get the ship in a good place. If Argus would speed it up. As usual. Hey now. Hey now. Hey now. <laughs> Bridge nav, can we get two zero meters one five zero? Not the end. There's a small sponge. Show us the way, fish. Take us all the way up to 
2,570 meters. Not on my watch. <laughs> So that's likely a diplocanthopoma, a bifidid. So they're related to the cusk eels. They are in the Ophidiformes. I think I spotted a small sea pen in amongst the rocks. More Amillogorgia militaris. like a sea cucumber on a rock. Aristea shrimp. What if we took the sample at 2592? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's up to the geologist. Uh. I'm putting it all in you, Coralie. We still got time. It's <laughs> the farthest we can go up. Well, we probably should start sampling now if we want to do it on our watch. Oh, you guys can move fast. We got six minutes. Yeah. I guess we can make the, the next watch watch you guys. Yeah, I was gonna say you could also just stay on the on the next watch. I'm not gonna put in any other other ship moves. If you wanted. Uh -huh. No, no uh -huh. chance. No chance. Somebody Delay them at the door. Head, hide the headsets or something. <laughs> Lock delay, the door. Delay. Don't let them in. Stall. Stall. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Where's young Jake? Deep in a game of cribbage, no doubt. Yeah. No, I'd never seen real people in real life playing cribbage until I walked onto the Really? Board. No. What's cribbage? It's a oh, golly, card game. Oh, you, you back row folks. That you play on boats. No, it's a, it's a card game, and there's like a, a board with pegs. It's kind of 